Yeah. Okay, well thank you very much for coming out yeah. to hear uh, this talk tonight. So, I, yeah, I was in Poland at the end of July, start of August, and uh, mainly to look at what remains of the Polish Brethren, the minor reformed church, the Aryan church, the Sicilian church, uh, known by a number of different names. But there was, as it said in the blurb, at the highest point there were 40,000 members approximately uh, of the minor reformed church, which was a Unitarian church in Poland uh, in the uh, 16th, 17th century. And they only really existed, uh, we know more or less exactly, from 1565 to 1658. That's the period we know uh, they were founded in and when they were destroyed, and they were utterly destroyed in the Counter-Reformation. Uh, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were wiped out in 1658. And when I was at college, and Arthur Long was the principal of Unitarian College, he used to say, he used to quote Raymond Holt and say that uh, you'd never think that there are some organizations or some uh, uh, people who can survive uh, uh, being utterly ruthlessly persecuted because the minor reform church is the example of something that was utterly destroyed by the opponents, a good thing that was destroyed, uh, so it's not all progress, now, of course they did survive in other ways, but they were completely wiped out, so I was, I was interested to go and see uh, some of what remains, I have some interest in unity and history, I don't know a great deal about Poland, and I can't speak Polish so I apologise in advance to anyone here who might know a bit of Polish, because you'll see but, uh, you're looking like you don't, so that's, <laughs> that's given me some, some comfort. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's start. Key, key person in the Mind Reform Church is this fellow, uh, Fausto Sorzini, in Italian, which is, he was Italian, Fausto Sosinus, as he's known in Latin. And Sosinus uh, is the, the most famous, uh, certainly 16th century Unitarian theologian. He's the most famous Italian Protestant theologian. Uh, he's a very famous Polish theologian. And one of the, the consequences of this is um, there's a lot of work on him uh, done in Poland, uh, Reformation studies in Poland, and uh, also in it Italy as well. And uh, he, he wrote an enormous amount, amount of stuff. He sort of acknowledged within the, the history of, uh, of, of British Unitarianism I don't, I don't think Sosinus is up here in the, in the ceiling, is he? No? Um, <coughs> Luther is, <coughs> but not Sosinus. <coughs> but um, he's, he's sort of acknowledged, but actual scholarly engagement is really not that great in the English-speaking world, apart from about three uh, historians who I'll talk about. Um, but it, it is in, uh, in Poland and Germany and Italy. And there's, if you could read those languages, and I really wish you could, you know, there's an awful lot to be learned about him and about the minor reformed church. And most English speakers really can't get into it because it isn't done in English. But there's, there's the brief background uh, to, uh, to Sosinus. He comes to Poland. Uh, he's exiled in the end from Italy. He's born into a noble family, a family of radical humanists and their and they all tend to get into trouble with, with the, uh, the Catholic hierarchy and in the end have to leave. And he leaves and comes to Poland, also goes to Transylvania. He's involved in the establishment of Unitarianism in Transylvania. But he is involved, though he doesn't found the minor reform church, the Polish Brethren. And um, when, he, when, he, when he goes there, he never becomes a member because they, the minor reform church are anti-Trinitarian. They reject the doctrine of the Trinity. They're also uh, pacifists. They, they, they um, reject the carrying of weapons most of the time and certainly are always against uh, kind of uh, uh, the general culture of, uh, uh, of military uh, idealism. They're also, uh, they have a tendency towards, towards a kind of pro uh, proposal for a communist system at different times. But they're also Anabaptists, so they, they believe in adult, adult baptism, they don't baptize children. Now, Sosinus isn't an Anabaptist, so he never formally joins. So in many ways, they're also tolerant, in many ways they're like us, but in many ways they're, they're not like us, but of course this is the 16th century. So here's Poland, as it was on, on, on the left there. This is a map of Poland 
1648. And uh, you might be able to compare it with the modern map here. Poland was a massive country at the start of the 17th century. The end of the 14th century, the crowns of Lithuania and Poland were united, and they formed what was the biggest country in Europe. And so if you see, this is, uh, the modern Poland is here, and it's, it's moved sort of westwards. So that, that purple bit there is only like around, somewhere around here, going into these parts of Germany. Right here. So, so Poland at that time included large chunk of the Ukraine here, the whole, I think, of Belarus, and Lithuania, and uh, Latvia here. So, and it was the biggest country in Europe. It had about 10 million population. And it, um, it was multinational, multilingual, multi-ethnic, multi-religious. And so one of, the, one of the, the chief features of it was it had a monarchy which technically was elected by the nobles. But the nobles had a lot of power. And when the nobles were sort of interested in new ideas and taking on new uh, religions, the people tended to follow them. So you did get a multiplicity of faiths in different places. And uh, you also had, obviously, a large Catholic population, large Orthodox population. There were also Muslims uh, who, who actually lived around here, uh, Tartars that had come to live here, there were Muslims there, and there were Calvinists and there were Unitarians as well. So it was an extraordinarily um, vibrant and um, also um, uh, varied society. So here's the timeline for them. Uh, the, the Reformation comes into Poland fairly soon after it starts in Germany, because there's also a lot of Germans living in, in Poland, and so Lutheran ideas arrive fairly rapidly, uh, but they are uh, <coughs> taken on board by the traditional sort of elements of society that like that kind of thing. So there, there are a lot of uh, merchants and, um, and professional people in the towns become Protestants. And then when the second wave of the Reformation comes, many of them become Calvinists. But what happens in Poland is uh, partly through um, uh, the, 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 the transmission of the writings of Michael Servetus, people start to get involved in, or interested in Unitarianism. And Unitarianism becomes, uh, anti-Trinitarian ideas become quite um, explicit within the Reformed Church. And from the 1550s, there are these divisions starting between Orthodox, Calvinist, uh, Protestants, and unorthodox, anti-Trinitarian Protestants who don't believe in original sin, and want to challenge the traditional kind of precepts of Calvinism. So in the middle of the 1560s, the, this church splits into what's called the Major Reformed Church and the Minor Reformed Church. The Minor Reformed Church being the, um, uh, the Polish Brethren. Uh, one of the things they're also interested in is kind of communal living. And they are given a town to settle in 1569, this place called Rakow which is about 30 miles from, from, from Krakow. And um, the local lord, I think his wife becomes a Unitarian, but she, uh, he, he creates this town and to escape some degree of persecution. Uh, and also just because they, they have this vision of a new Jerusalem, they come and they, they found this town. And they, they build it up into quite a, a significant place. And we'll look at Rakow later on. Uh, later on, uh, Sotsini, South Sinus comes. In the 17th century, Rakoff becomes, uh, and one historian, Philip Hewitt, described it as the world capital of Unitarianism. They, they have, a, have a really important academy which attracts students from all over Europe. They have a printing press, they pour out uh, publications which go all over Europe, and they um, really at the forefront of, of intellectual life and uh, it's quite an important place. It's one of two academies. A lot of people have heard of the Rakov Academy and heard of the Rakovian Catechism, which is a publication, that, a very important publication made. But there was another, another academy at this place called Lejna, uh, which actually lasted long and which is similarly a very important place. Now, I went to Rakov, I didn't go uh, to Lejna. 
And as you can see, that's the timeline. And it all ends for them uh, in 1658. Now, this is the church at Sesamin. And this was the site of the first public expressive Unitarianism by Peter Benicius, as it's called in Latin. Now, this is a modern Catholic church. And like, like all of them, it is very, very ornate. And of course, Poland is today a very, very Catholic country. But they all, they tended to reuse these uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, local churches. And, and uh, as is the case in, in England, you know, when the Reformation came and the authorities determined that religion should change from Catholic uh, to Anglican, all the churches did. Uh, in Poland, this happened where the local lord changed his religion. So when the local lord of Sesamin became a Protestant, the church became Protestant. And uh, later on, when they, in the, in the, under, the, under the, the force of the Counter-Reformation, when they returned to Catholicism, uh, the church returned. But in this church, in, in the far corner there, you can just see if there's this memorial here, which is actually a memorial to uh, a reformed minister. So there's still sort of little elements surviving from the Reformation period, which you can see in, in, in these, these churches. Uh, now, also around the side of this church is um, this uh, stone which I think is indicative of the refusal to, refusal to bear arms probably of the, uh, the Lord at the time in this place. Uh, some of them they, they refused to bear arms, some of them carried wooden swords instead as an indication of their pacifist tendencies. Now, whenever I go to uh, any, anywhere, particularly in Europe, to study some kind of historical thing, I always like to, to have a look at what Alexander Gordon did first. Because Alexander Gordon uh, was a very distinguished Unitarian historian in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, he was also a minister in Liverpool, in Hope Street, and minister in Belfast as well. Uh, but when he was at Belfast, uh, he... he uh, he tra travelled in the summer of 1879 across Europe and um, he was a real pioneer because some of the places I'll show you, like the grave of Sosinus, he was the first British Unitarian to ever visit it in 1879. Uh, and there's not been that many since. I mean, I think probably there's only been about, been less than 20 British Unitarians have been to Sosinus' grave, although everyone see it on, on, on the internet now. But he, when he went, it was uh, probably a much more difficult journey than it, than it is today. And uh, they're rather like, what's his name, Michael Portillo. He, he, he got the train and probably in Ostend and travelled across Europe. And, uh, he went, he went to, to Poland and went in various um, um, uh, archives and found lots of stuff that nobody knew. And on the way, learnt Polish and Hungarian uh, so we could study the text when he got there. I mean, that's, that's a measure of how able he was. Uh, so, uh, you know, and he had that advantage then of, uh, of being able to, uh, uh, to really understand these kind of things. But there's a picture of Gordon. I think about the time, I think about the time when he was actually in Liverpool. And a couple of other historians who, uh, the, the, the main one, the famous one everyone knows is this fellow, Earl Morse Wilbur, who wrote A History of Unitarianism. Sinianism and its antecedents. And he, he wrote a couple of massive sort of blockbusters on the whole history of Unitarianism in Europe. And more recently, Philip Hewitt is there with me and Isaac Barth from Oxford, uh, who died uh, just the other year, just last year. He, he did a lot in recent years um, to uncover a lot of this history. And he went to Rakov, and he was the first Unitarian to stay in Rakov uh, since, since they, were, they were forcibly shut down in 1638. But I'll be referring to all three of those historians. Now, the other thing about Poland was it was multi-religious, multi-ethnic, and it was also a tolerant society. If we think of the Reformation, we think of people being burned at the stake and so on, and obviously that was a feature of the Reformation, not only here but in uh, most parts of Europe. Actually, uh, like Transylvania, uh, um, Poland. Uh, brought in uh, a whole sort of era, era of tolerance for different religions. And so the king uh, um, 
uh, called Sig uh, Sig um, Sigmund Augustus. He he said to uh, he said at one 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 occasion, uh, "Permit me to be king of the sheep as well as the goats." He didn't want to persecute the Protestants, and um, his father. Uh, I forgot what he said. His father said something. Um, Something similar, and, and so this is you can you can read that uh, 1573. This the Confederation of Warsaw is, is actually the, the Polish Parliament, um, but um, one of the points that Philip Hewitt always liked to make was that actually last year we we celebrated the 450th anniversary of the Edict of Torda in Transylvania, which ushered in toleration there, but actually. So this is slightly later, there were actually edicts of toleration in Poland before that. So Poland was the first country in Europe to express uh, an idea of tolerance for uh, different religions. So we were staying in Krakow, um, and this was one, one of the places where uh, Reformation ideas came into Poland first. But they didn't stop there. As I mentioned, this is a vast country. Uh, and uh, the Unitarians went in a sort of localized black spot kind of area. They were spread all over um, Poland, and they were in areas which would be um, largely uh, Slavic and Orthodox. They'd be in areas where there were, there were Germans, there'd be areas where uh, people were Polish, and um, it was quite, actually quite quite widely spread across the whole of that territory. Now, but that's a little bit of. Uh, uh, detail about how how Protestantism and, and Unitarianism came into uh, Krakow. They reckon about 10%, the city is about 10% Protestant in 1568. Uh, and I was reading just, just the other week this article by a Polish professor in English, and he, he, he uh, he reported that there is evidence for this kind of anti-Trinitarian sect already existing in the 1530s and 1540s in Krakow. Now, what I want to link with that is the next slide. This is the market square in Krakow. Has anybody been to Krakow? It's a popular place to go. It's worth going. It's a beautiful place. Um, <coughs> this is the market square. And it's a quotation from Alexander Gordon from his trip in 1879. He found this uh, picture of Archbishop, this statue of Archbishop Peter Gamrat, who burned Catherine Weigel uh, in the marketplace in 1539. Now, Catherine Weigel was accused of being a Judaizer and uh, adopting Jewish practices. Uh, and some of the early reports, the early accounts say she was married to someone who was Jewish. But she wasn't, uh, and she she was she kept in, she was kept in prison for ten years, and she was burned to the stake at the age of eighty in 1539. So it was incredibly uh, rough treatment she got. Now again, this this is not characteristic of the way Poland was. It, it, why, I have no idea why she was singled out for such cruelty, but she was, and. Um, uh, between 1550 and 1650, as a matter of fact, th there are only 12 recorded examples of people being burnt at the stake. Whereas just in the end of the 16th century, in England, in the reign of Mary and Elizabeth, there are 500. So it's, it's quite a difference. But unfortunately, this lady was very badly treated and seems to have been basically an anti-Trinitarian. So I, I, I would think she was connected to this underground anti-Trinitarian group, although the fellow I was in class said there's no evidence for it. Well, the, you know, seems a likely uh, conclusion to me. Um, she was, um, when she was sent to the Inquisition before they, they killed her, she said, I believe in the existence of one God who has created all the visible and invisible world and who cannot be conceived by the human intellect. And for that she was imprisoned for 10 years and then burnt at the stake. Now the, 
one of the places that Alexander Gordon visited, and this, this wasn't on our tour, so I was pleased to be able to find this church, is, is this place, which is the Dominican church. And uh, Gordon wrote about it in a letter to the Christian life, and he went and, and had, a, had, a, had a very uh, interesting experience checking out this place. And I was really pleased to find it. Uh, Troisky Kostiol means Holy Trinity. And according to the account that he tells, which is told in a number of other sources, there was a Protestant minister who preached there in 1562 uh, a, a, a sermon in favour of Unitarianism. And in front of the church there was a big, a big tower with a golden ball on the top. And when he preached this sermon, uh, the golden ball fell off. <laughs> and, um, uh, well, I see what Gordon says. And, and, and Robert Wallace, who wrote a book called The Anti-Trinitarian Biography, he said, the citizens crowded to hear his sermons. Some said that the blow was meant to strike terror to the heart of the preacher, but others said that it was intended to impart new courage to him. The wiser and more reflecting portions of the community were silent. Uh, so, <laughs> no, it's a, um, but th this is a fascinating building, uh, this church, and it's um, it's a very beautiful uh, building. It dates back to the 13th century. It includes cloisters, and it, it, it's quite a, quite an extensive site. It's undergoing extensive renovation at the moment, all paid for by the EU, uh, which will, if you're a Remainer, will will warm your heart. If you're a Lever, will if you feel not warmed, I suppose, but uh, uh, quite a lot of the big and beautiful churches in Krakow are being restored uh, by, by European money. Uh, and, and there's an interesting uh, uh, sort of comparison between that and what's happening to the surviving Unitarian buildings. Uh, but it is a very beautiful building. Uh, this is what uh, Gordon said, uh, and I, I, I went in there trying to find all the things Gordon had found. And I couldn't find them all because it's full of scaffolding, the main church. Um, but he, uh, he, he gives this account when he was there um, of, uh, of what was going on. And <coughs> it, it is very impressive. And the music is very impressive. And white-robed Dominicans uh, still uh, running around the place. In fact, we've got a picture of one of the cloisters. And there's, there's a white-robed Dominican there. I didn't see any women virgins. But... Um, one of the, uh, I, I was trying to find a, a statue of uh, Stephen Battery and I, uh, and King John Casimir, and I asked one of the, the, the brothers about it, and he just said to me, he said, no Deutsch, no Deutsch, no Deutsch, uh, which was a bit, I found a bit odd because I didn't think I was German, and uh, I, for some reason I said to him, parlez vous français, which, <laughs> which was a very unhelpful thing to say because I can't speak <laughs> French anymore, I can speak German. But he just shook his hands at me and, and, and walked off rather briskly. So, <laughs> look, I think Gordon got more out of them than I did. Uh, but it's a very, very impressive place. That's the ceiling in the, uh, in the chancel. The, the main part of the chancel is covered over with a big painting because behind it that they're restoring it. And that's the, that's the choir stalls. Uh, so that's in, that's in Krakow, and that, that is this church which seems to have had a short Unitarian interlude. Uh, but outside the country, we were taken on a tour of what survives of the Polish Brethren churches. Now, it's... It, I was astonished at how much has survived because if you think these buildings date from the 17th century uh, and if you think of the history of Poland which is a tortured country uh, it's amazing that anything survived and if you think about our churches here which all, many of them had origins in the 17th century there's virtually nothing that survives you know, the, the ancient chapel would be a very prominent uh, uh, exception to that but uh, it's the same in Ireland. My church is all dated in the 17th century, but there's nothing remains of those original buildings. But, but even though this church was forcibly closed in 1658, there are good examples of what their church is like. So here's the first one we went to. There's a place called Cheskovi. And as you can see, it's, it's fairly uh, derelict. But this church, and you can see there's a, there's a sign there government sign next to it, and it's called in Polish Zabor Alianski, 
the, 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 the common Polish term to refer to all these churches as Arian churches after the, the uh, 4th century theologian Arius. Uh, so usually you'd see a sign as a boar at the Anski. And um, these buildings are in state care, but the, the people, the Unitarians and Poland who are interested in them, all say they're basically neglected. They, they, they get, now this is, you can see it's got a new roof on it, but um, it's in need of restoration. But it, it's, it's a, a rural a building uh, in, in, in a, you know, quite a, uh, out in the countryside really. Um, the, um, it was closed in 1658 and then used as a grain store. But it survived till the present day. So that, that, this is uh, uh, Chescovi, uh, and there's a s couple of side views of it. Basically, you've got two rooms downstairs and one room upstairs. The upstairs, or, or, or maybe more than one room, but the upstairs, we couldn't go upstairs. The upstairs room is where the minister lived, and downstairs there were two rooms. In this case, there's a meet the church, church room, meeting room, and also a school room. So this is the this is the this is the room they would have used for worship, and you can see even the doors have survived from the 17th century, which is remarkable, really. Um, but you might just be able to see above the door there, uh, there is a, an inscription. Let me give you a close up of that. Uh, a close up of the doors. That inscription there is this. Um, that's Polish. Anybody guess what that says? If you see at the end there, the clue where it comes from, yeah, that's Matthew's Gospel, and it's uh, in Polish, Ni Skarbsi Sobi Skarbov Na Ziemi, which is Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. So you'd expect a biblical quotation um, in, 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 the, in the chapel. Now in the meeting room, going into the meeting room on the other side, this quotation's above the door. Anybody recognize that? That's in Latin. That says, Sic vos non vobis nidificatis aves. Well, I, 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 would, I would have given you a chance. I wouldn't have known, obviously, but it, it, it's actually from Virgil. And it says, Thus do you birds build nests for others. So that's a quotation from Virgil. So this is a rural con congregation in, in rural Poland and uh, a, a, a lit literalist biblical Protestant congregation that would obviously put a biblical quotation above the door. But in the meeting house, the, the Sunday school or whatever, they have a quotation from Virgil, from classical law. So it gives you an example of the culture, because these were, and they were, they were seriously scholarly orientated people. You know, they, they weren't just blind fundamentalists. And you wouldn't find, I think, a 17th century Unitarian church in Britain that has quotation from Virgil. You might do in the 19th century, but not in the 17th century, 16th century. So there's another church, this is a place called Colossi we went to, which is smaller, I, I don't think there's an upstairs here. And then you see the date stone, 1654, so it was four years before it was closed, and it was forcibly closed four years later. And on the day we went here, it was very, very hot, and um, the fellow who was organising the tour, a fellow called Jay Atkinson, who's retired professor at Star King in California. And while we were on the way, he, uh, he collapsed with the heat and uh, hit his head and had to go to the hospital. So we took him to the hospital. And, then we, and he, he was going to conduct an act of worship in here. So he wasn't able to do it. So there were three ministers on the tour, me and a couple of others. And we were asked to do a service, so we, we, we had about half an hour to prepare on the way, but we were able to do it, and it was a great privilege to have our little service. This is the inside. You can see there are benches in there, and you can see the floor, and you can see what it's like inside. But again, you know, it, a remarkable survival, but would benefit from, uh, from restoration. That's Colossi. Now we also went to this place called uh, Moskovchuf, which is now a Roman Catholic church, and as you can see, it's very, very well maintained, very well uh, restored, um, and um, it's uh, 
like, like all the Catholic Church in Poland, very, very ornate. But this was, uh, it's on the estate of this family, also called Moscow Jews. And they became Calvinists, and then they became Unitarians, and so the church became successively Calvinist and Unitarian. And then eventually, of course, they were converted back to Catholicism, and it went back to being a Catholic church. Uh, but um, I, I think those two churches have shown that our church is built by the Polish brethren. Other times they would have been using the parish church, which would have looked just like whatever the parish church uh, looked like. Uh, so obviously this is this probably uh, restored a good deal, but gives you an idea of, of, of another type of church. So that's uh, two views. That's a, again, there are features that are obviously very old, like the front door, and this is the door into uh, the vestry on the right. You can look through to the, the altar, and uh, you see these letters uh, C M B chalked on the door. Does anyone know what that means? Never seen that saw that a few times in Poland and I think you will see I've never seen it before but you will see it in some countries it's that and there's a date underneath and you see the Roman numerals for 20 for the blessing of the building is yeah. it like the uh, frankincense yeah that's it that's, that's exactly it. it yeah yeah that's it that's it yeah yeah on I think the, the eve of epiphany or on epiphany the priest goes around all the houses in the parish and he chalks CMB, that is the gifts. You know, bro the reason why I know that yeah, is because yeah. a Polish family asked yeah. me to go to their house, yeah, uh, yeah. which is an old Methodist church, yeah, yeah. and to yeah. bring those three gifts yeah, and bless yeah. it. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, they're all the last window, they yeah. turn the stained glass window, and they put the stained three gifts, uh, yeah. for instance. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what they do. Yeah, yeah. 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 But they, they must start in, in the church, I think. Yeah. But, but this is Moscow Jew uh, Church, which was Unitarian, and, and there, are, there are two memorials on the wall still, which are very difficult to read, but they, they are of uh, female members of the family, and uh, who were definitely Unitarians, but they're still on the wall, despite it being a Catholic church today. Now, they also built a sort of schoolroom. Well, this is, this is where it is situated. On the left is a sort of uh, 60s Soviet style social housing on the right is the the family home where they would have lived until, until the end of the war and uh, it's like some parts uh, of Poland pretty well dilapidated the building on the, on the extreme right is the schoolroom this one uh, and, and again this is in state care and you can't really see it but there's a little sign of, of a in the middle there, which is indicative that it's state owned. But again, all the people, there was only, only a few from Poland there, but all the people who are interested in Poland, they all say it's just neglect. You know, really, they could do much more to, to, to maintain these places. And it is abandoned, but it, it, it's owned by the museum. But it was used by, um, so used by them as a schoolroom, schoolhouse, and then subsequently as a chapel uh, when they were kicked out of the church, and then eventually they were kicked out of there. Some other views of it. You can see it's pretty rocky, but an interesting one. Okay. Um, now, this is a contrast. It's a place called uh, Ludinia, which is um, an estate where there's a wooden. Um, you can see this. This is the, the, the manor house, which has been beautifully restored by the gentleman who owns that. He's also restored the chapel, which is down the end there with the satellite dish on. And he's done a great job of that. Uh, you can see that on the left there's the chapel. He also, because he's come into possession of this piece of Sicinian history, he's built up a really fantastic collection of Sicinian uh, publications, prints and books and so on, which he had on display in the downstairs of the chapel for us. Uh, I'm not sure what he, do, what he does or but he, he's, uh, he's got a very valuable collection of books. But, but this is an example of a quite a small uh, chapel that's been restored. You can see upstairs, is, 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 I think he has an office in it, but that would have been the, where the minister lived. Uh, that's it. I thought it was another one of those. No. 
Anyway, so let's go back to Krakow. So, uh, back to Fausto Sotsini. When Alexander Gordon first, when he arrived in Krakow, the first place he went to was this place, Ulica Braca, which is a street, which means something like Brother Street or Brotherly Street, and this is where Sosinus lived in, um, in Krakow. And this here, this big house, this is the house where he lived. And uh, although there, there's been a lot of changes, in, in obviously in Krakow since, but it, they know that's where he lived. It would be very difficult to know um, even where somebody lived sometimes in Liverpool in, in the 18th century, but they, that, that is the house. Um, and it's called, um, it's called Ulrika Braca because at the end of the road you can see the church there. That is, um, that's the Franciscan church, so it's named after them. And there's, there's this house on the right. The downstairs is now um, a hairdresser's. And uh, the lady who owns it has been, um, we sort of had to, to sort of be quiet outside so we didn't, didn't annoy the people there because they, they've been persecuted by Unitarians asking them for the right to put a, a plaque up, which is an entirely reasonable thing to do. Krakow is full of plaques. And she, she became fairly amenable to it, the owner apparently, but um, her children don't like the idea at all. And, 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 and they won't. There, there is sometimes quite a lot of resistance to this idea of embracing heresy in Poland. Not always, but there is sometimes. And at one point it seemed she was going to do it, and she wrote to the priest of the big, big church in the centre of Krakow asking his permission. And he wrote back and said, well, it's really up to you, it's nothing to do with me. Um, but, but it doesn't look like they're going to do it but it would be just right to have a to have a, a plaque for him that's where he lived, obviously the house has probably been changed a bit since then but he lived there from 1580 to 1598 and in 1598 a group of students uh, decided uh, to attack him they dragged him out of the house, they beat him up they took all his books out and set them alight and they were going to uh, throw him in the river but for some, uh, some other students came from the university and some of the professors and uh, they rescued him and took him to the university which is this place, uh, Jagiellon University which is again, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful sort of 16th century but he was, he was taken there, he was saved, his life was saved, his house was wrecked his books were destroyed and he had to leave Krakow and he went to live uh, at a place called uh, Lusvarice um, now there was, there was in the town a Unitarian church, a Sicilian church, it was here. This is the site in Krakow of the, uh, uh, of the Aryan church which was built in 1571, uh, I think, or sometime in 1570, built of wood. And again, uh, particularly in Krakow, there were times when things became very tense and people, townspeople tore it down in 1591. So it was destroyed in 1591 and they rebuilt this Catholic church on the site shortly after. Again, you see very ornate Catholic church dedicated to uh, St. Thomas, as in Doubting Thomas. And this was a, a typical kind of dedication of the time you know, to show uh, the, the Doubting Unitarians that there was a better way. Now, um, we also went to uh, the grave of Faustus Socinus. And um, Gordon went there, Alexander Gordon went there in 1879. Now he didn't actually see this, this building. But he, um, we, we got in, a, we got in, a, in a, uh, a big coach and it took us two hours in sweltering heat to get there, but we got there all right. Uh, Gordon went there in 1879 and he, he, he wrote an account of his uh, his trip, uh, and he was the first. He was the first English-speaking Unitarian ever to visit this site. Um, and you know, it was, it was a place he had to find first. Um, he said he made fruitless inquiries in Krakow and Breslau, but eventually found Luzovice on a military map. The nearest station was at Bogomilovice, some 12 miles away. But he got off the train at a place called Turnoff, about 16 miles away. And he, yeah, appropriate name, and he visited the grave, 
by walking a circuit out to Luslovice and back to Bogomilovice, uh, a round trip according to his own reckoning of 28 miles. But he said it was a fine walk through a charming country and the fatigues of the road were abated by a, a friendly lift for some five miles given me by a hospitable Jew. Uh, Gordon was able to meet up with the Catholic priest in the nearest town and uh, he, he offered him to be his guide. And Because the other thing to remember is this part of the world, there was a very large Jewish population too. And of course, uh, their descendants in the 20th century, all, nearly all of them would have perished in the gas chambers. Now this isn't actually uh, the grave. It's the gravestone, what left, what's left of the gravestone. What Gordon would have seen when he went there, something like that in the top left-hand corner, that's basically this big cube here and this broken stone at the front here. That's all, that's all there was for, from about 1609, okay, no bother, from about 1609 uh, until, um, uh, until the 1930s, it was really just, uh, uh, that's, all, that's all there was to mark his grave. And what happened was he died in 1604 and um, uh, Philip Hewitt said that at the time there could have been no more suitable place for a, um, a grave of a, of a leading heretic but times soon changed and within a few years they torn down his grave, smashed it up, threw a lot of it in the, uh, in the river nearby and possibly also uh, threw his bones in the river. But it was quite an ornate gravestone. Um, yeah, Philip Hewitt recounts how the site of Sassini's grave was in 1604 as secure a setting for an arch heretic as could be found anywhere. Uh, a few years later, it was it was spoiled and wrecked, and all that remained was the cube-shaped stone, one huge block of limestone, some four foot square, which Gordon says once carried an inscription on each side. And these are each in a different language. But the only one that's visible today is this one here, which is in Italian. And the Italian means, the one who virtue sows doth reap renown, and true renown doth triumph over death. Uh, by tradition, the inscription, one of the inscriptions, which was supposedly hacked off on the other side, in Latin uh, said, uh, Babylon is completely overthrown, Luther demolished the roof, Calvin the walls, but to sign us the foundations. But in even 1879, when Gordon saw this stone, he couldn't find that inscription. I did find another one that had the initials SW, which I think is that one at the bottom there, and that it probably belonged to the Visovati family, which were related to, to Sosinus. So that's how the grave looks. And it was uh, Earl Morse Wilbur uh, who visited there in, in the 30s. He got a famous Polish architect design this tomb uh, so um, it's um, in the 1930s yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's fairly modern but it includes those two elements that were part of the region um, now you can see the wall behind it's inside the estate at, at Luzovice um, <coughs> which um, can you put the next one on for there we are there, there's, there's all of us there who saw it, pilgrims. This, this dog was very interested. Uh. The monument was designed by the architect Adolf Sisko Bohus in 1933. But um, I. I when Philip Hewitt went there, he, he, he worked out he was the fifth English-speaking Unitarian to get there, and that was in the late 60s. And even since then, there's only been two or three previous trips like this. There's very few people have actually been there. So I was really pleased to, to, to go there. But it's inside the estate of um, uh, this, this Luzvavice. And uh, do you want to put the next slide on for us? Gordon said in 1879, the adjacent slosh, the castle, uh, is modern, but with traces of antiquity about it. And this is the adjacent slosh. And today it's owned by an eminent Polish conductor called Christoph Penderecki. 
Uh, he's also an amateur botanist, and the uh, the grounds uh, are full, planted very richly, very beautifully, and there are supposed to be 700 different types of plants in the grounds. But because it's been inside this estate, um, certainly since the start of the 20th century, it's been fairly secure when it obviously had a lot of trouble uh, over the years. If you put the next slide on for us, you can see some of the, the estate. Um, and um, and th this one, and Gordon said, uh, the spacious garden adjoining Sotsini's last resting place lies in the midst of a secluded but rich and fertile vale sprinkled with noble trees and embosomed by a glorious amphitheatre of swelling hills. So that, that's a fairly good description of what it's like uh, still today. And uh, this fellow, this conductor, has built nearby a really beautiful modern music college. And we went there and were able to hear, there was a, a fellow playing the lute and someone singing. And we were able to hear some uh, Polish brethren songs that they've uh, found and, and have, have uh, have managed to, uh, uh, to, to to have them published, and, and we were able to hear them, which was they've been they've been so sort of transposed for performance by lute and, and soloists rather than congregation. But we were able to hear examples of, of Polish brethren music. So we'll just if you move on, next one we'll just move to um, <coughs> Rakov, which was the site of this academy. It was the site of an experimental community. It was a site of an important printing press. It was a site of a lot of scholarly activity. They translated the Bible into Polish. Um, they produced the Rakovian Catechism, which was a sort of Socinian statement of faith. And in 1605, it was published. Socinus probably mo wrote most of it, but it was finished after his death. And with probably rather more optimism than the circumstances uh, allowed, they sent it to King James I of England for his approval. And uh, he promptly had it burnt by the common hangman outside the Tower of London, so it didn't go down very well. But the Rakov was this, particularly in its second era. The first, at the end of the 16th century, there was what's called the Perpetual Synod, and there was, there was constant sort of meetings and discussions while they sort of tried to hammer out ideas and things. And, uh, it was probably not so productive. Uh, like a perpetual GA, it must have been fairly hard going, I think. <laughs> but the, the, uh, in, in the 17th century, it really was this incredibly uh, radical and exciting and, and energetic uh, institution. And this is, in Rakov, Rakov is a very small town, uh, it's a village really. Uh, but the people there, and, and they're all, they all would be nominally Catholic, uh, there are no Unitarians at all. But they have really bought into the history that, 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 that their town has. And they've set up this Rokovian society. And they've built a museum. And they, they try and publicize and, uh, and build on that historical identity. So we went there. And they, they, there was all sorts of things arranged for us. And um, there was, um, they had uh, young people dressed up in, in period costumes showing sort of the way life was. And, and things like this in, in, in the 17th century. But it was also, it was, it was an academy where, um, of a university standard, there's no doubt about that. And people did travel from all over Europe to be educated uh, at Rakhov. Um, yeah, and, and um, uh, Philip Hewitt called it the European, the Unitarian capital of Europe. Uh, now, in 1638, um, there were some uh, students from the academy out walking in the countryside and they came across a wayside um, um, statue which they decided to throw stones at. And behind that probably there was probably also a land dispute over who owned which bit of land and so on. And as a result this was considered de desecration and as a result the, the whole academy was closed down in one go, 1638. So it ended just, just overnight. And uh, now, there's, not only did it end, they raised the academy to the ground, they raised the printing press to the ground, they destroyed everything that was associated with it. And Rakov, which had been quite a flourishing little town, uh, sunk into, in, in, into uh, decay. There's, now there's a view, you see there isn't a lot to see in Rakov today, and um, that's, there's a view going out of town. 
they also try and acknowledge and honor the, the Jewish community, which of course is now uh, completely uh, gone. It was probably about, um, in, in the Unitarian days, it wasn't all Unitarian, but probably the majority of the population were Unitarian. In the 19th century, when Alexander Gordon went there, it probably would have been about um, two-thirds Catholic, one-third Jewish. And it's interesting that Gordon says he got a lift from a hospitable Jew. Mm. And uh, you can imagine probably Gordon probably spoke to him in Hebrew, I think. Uh, when um, when, when Morse, Earl Morse Wilbur went there, he really didn't like it. And uh, uh, Philip Hewitt uh, recorded what Earl Morse Wilbur did when he visited Rakoff. And this is a leading Boston Unitarian. This is in 1924. He said, to reach it, he wrote, required 25 hours and my being up most of the night, both going and coming. My visit fell on a raw November day with clouds hanging low. This set the scene for poor, poor impression. It is positively the wretchedest little town I've ever seen, he wrote. The houses were unspeakably squalid and animals running at large in the muddy streets and marketplace gave the town the appearance of a huge barnyard or even pigsty. Half the, half the inhabitants were Russian Jews of the most repulsive sort. It was all too much for a Unitarian with a refined New England background. <laughs> <laughs> As there was nothing more for me to see, he continued, and I could not bear to spend a whole dreary afternoon in so miserable a place with no decent place even to eat in, I made my way to a neighbouring village and threw myself upon the hospitality of a Polish gentleman to whom I had no introduction, but whose name I had casually learned at Krakow. I was at first received with civil reserve, but proverbial Polish hospitality did not fail simply to come as an American carries one far in Poland. So, <laughs> so, so that's an interesting account from 1923. But, but the, the people who were there really key. And the other thing about the, 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 the Sassinians, the Minor Reformed Church, they kind of fed into to streams of Polish patriotism and nationalism. Poland was dismembered in the end of the 18th century, part of it going to Prussia, part to Austria, part to Russia, and it was destroyed until really after, after the First World War. Uh, but those who could have had a vision of kind of Polish revival uh, in the 19th century, that they tapped into to the Lukovians and to the Sicinians because they saw them as embodying something about Polish life and Polish nationalism, Polish identity, right or wrongly. Uh, they were religious really rather than, than political, but, but they found something in there that they could use to identify as purely Polish. Um, so as I say, Philip Hewitt visited here in 1969, and he, he, he stayed the night, unlike, unlike Earl Morse Will, but he managed to stay, and he, he got on very well with them. And he realized he was the first Unitarian to spend the night in Rakoff since 1638. This is a picture they got on the wall there, which is uh, a copy of a painting on the ceiling of the bishop's palace at Kielce, and uh, Bishop Zadzik's palace. And this is showing the king expelling uh, the Unitarians in, uh, I think, in 1658. Well, maybe, yeah, you, well, you see, there's two expulsions. There's the expulsion of, of Rakoff in 1638, and the... Um, the whole, the whole denomination was expelled in 1658. But in the middle there, it's a copy, it's not a great copy, there. that's the king, and these are the bishops, and the leading magistrates, and these are the Aryans here, getting their punishment here. But I, if, if I'd had more time, I'd like to have gone to Kielsa, because you can see this original uh, painting. Um, but uh, that, it, it's a, a memorial of the, the end of the community, really. Now, <coughs> the one in, in, in Rakov, there's a bar, Ariansky, uh, you know, there's just a little bar and they've named it the Aryan Bar and the, the local people do remember this. But there's also a big Catholic church, which is here, which is built on the site of the Polish Brethren Church. Now, there's a fairly new priest there and apparently <coughs> he knew we were coming and he told the Rakovian society they can walk around the outside but they can't come in. Oh, wow. So we weren't allowed to go in. Uh, now, the previous one, uh, 
the previous one had been apparently you know was was all in favour of this, and you could see the benefit for tourism if nothing else. But the the, the new priest uh, has has kind of tried to institute his own counter reformation. <laughs> so, so we were told not you know don't don't go in. We were told not to go in. But it's it's built on the site of the. Um, can, can you can yeah. you? Um, the so there, there, there's a front view, and you can see uh, you can see down here there's a, there's a sort of monument there. Uh, if you uh, if you put the, the the next one on, you can see yeah there. Um, Philip Hewitt transcribes something of what that says. So it was built in uh, 1655 to the glory of God the One in Three. You can see at the bottom there's a sort of symbol representing the Trinity. Um, so there's no messing about there as far as they're concerned. Uh, but as I say, you know, that, that was 1655. There was a bit of a rapprochement more recent times un until the, <laughs> the current uh, incumbent. Um, and, uh, but we were allowed to walk around and just around the side, if you put the next one on for us, Phil, I think there is what was the, the minister's house. It's the 16th century building that was where the minister lived when the, the Sicinian church was there. Now, when they first started this Recovery Society, after Philip Hewitt had come, and after he'd started their interest in their own history, they secured this little building from the church and they turned it into a museum. And all the museum items that they have in the, the other building were all in there. And uh, this, this was an important focus of, of, uh, of interest for Unitarians. But again, the current incumbent uh, kicked them out and uh, banned them from the building. And he turned it into a pilgrimage centre, uh, which, which didn't last very long. So it's just, just not used now. But that was the house where the minister lived. Uh, in the 16th and 17th century. Um, and so, um, <coughs> they were kicked out of Rakov in 1638. They were expelled from Poland in 1658. They gave them the choice to convert uh, or leave or die. And um, most of them had to convert. But um, well, one thing that happened was that um, the ideas didn't die, and particularly uh, a lot of the kind of intellectual idea moved to Holland, to the Netherlands, and Amsterdam, and th there was their uh, whole republication of all the books that had been published in um, in Rakoff, which is the the Bibliotheca Fratrum Polonorum Quos Unitarius Vocant, and uh, this, this has been reprinted in more recent times, but it's reprinted in the 17th century, all these works that were produced in Rakov. Um, influence came onto sort of into England too, philosophers like John Locke and so on, uh, to the Remonstrant Church in the Netherlands. And also the, the biggest sort of exodus of people was to Transylvania. And about a hundred families went to Kolesvar, to Cluj, and they kept the Polish church Polish Unitarian Church alive until the end of the 18th century. And it, it didn't really die. They eventually intermarried amongst the, the Hungarian speakers. And uh, at the end of the 18th century, when they, cho when they closed the, uh, the Polish church in College Bar, they used the money to build the first Unitarian church if you've been to College Bar, the big church there, partly funded by the closure of this um, Polish church. And there's a, there's a Polish uh, memorial in, in the vestibule there. So although in some ways they were, they were utterly destroyed, their ideas have uh, lived on and uh, there's still quite a lot that you can detect, that you can find uh, if you go in search of it in Poland. So that's my experiences in Poland. Thank you.